Today's webinar will begin in three minutes. Today's webinar will begin in one minute. Welcome to today's webinar, Updates from the International AIDS Conference, IAS 2019. I would like to introduce Roy M. Hewlick, MD, MPH, Rochelle Belfer, Professor in Medicine and Chief Division of Infectious Disease at Wheel Cornell Medicine in New York, New York. Welcome, Dr. Hewlick. Thanks very much. Happy to be here. Welcome everybody on the line. Good afternoon for East Coast and Central Time and good morning to everybody else. So a couple intro slides. Please go to update your account to www.iasusa.org and log into your account um, and that will allow you to claim credit for today's talk. And the credits that we're offering are ACCME approved credits. We're giving 1.25 credits to physicians. And in addition, we are giving 1.25 American Nurses Credentialing Center Commission on Accreditation credits, as well as 1.25 hours of pharmacotherapy credit. Um, for the nurses, and pharmacy credits also will be given by the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, 0.125. The evaluations will be available today in your IAS USA My Activities page by 5 p.m. Pacific time today, that's 8 p.m. Eastern, and see the website for further information on how to obtain the CME credits. We are grant supported for this webinar today. You can see our platinum supporters listed there, Gilead, Merck, and Vive, and additional support has been provided by Janssen. 
To navigate the webinar, we will use poll questions. You'll see a separate window that will pop up and show the poll questions. And you can choose your response from the poll. Don't use the chat box for that. And then we'll show you what the group responded after the polling closes. If you want to ask questions for today's conference, please see the box labeled Chat Everyone, and everyone will be able to see what you write there. And uh, please put any questions about the program that, that you'd like me to address there. Most likely we'll take those at the end of the presentation today. Many people are typing their affiliations into that box. That's not the right place to do it. Okay, let's ask a poll question. From which area of the are you viewing this webinar? You can see the various choices there. Parts of the US, Canada, Mexico, um, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, or other, although I'm not sure what that would be. So go ahead and vote. People are voting now. We'll just give that a little bit of time. OK, and can we display the results there? So it looks like the majority of people, just under half, are from the Northeast with 49%. Second most popular is Southeast US with 39%, followed by the Midwest with 18%, the West with 16%. And then we welcome a smatter, smattering of people from Canada, Mexico, South America, Europe, Asia, Australia, Africa, and we actually had three others. No idea where you're from, but welcome anyway. OK. Next question. When will the evaluation for this webinar, which you must complete in order to claim CME or other credit, be available on my activities page in your IAS USA account? Immediately, by 5 PM Pacific, that's 8 p.m. Eastern, or when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie. OK, I think we can stop this poll. All right, so the most popular answer was correct by 5 p.m. Pacific time today. And thanks to the 6% of you who voted for when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie. OK, last question. Please rate your level of expertise in the medical management of HIV infection. Scales 1 to 5. 1 is novice, and 5 is expert. OK. So it looks like the majority of people would rank themselves as a three or a four. We also have some full experts on board as well as some ones and twos. So a wide variety of expertise. Welcome to everybody. All right, so let's jump in. Updates from the International AIDS Conference, IAS 2019. I have no financial relationships to disclose. Uh, my peer reviewer here was Carlos Del Rio from Emory, who also has no affiliations. Donna Jacobson, who is the executive director of IAS USA, again, has no financial affiliations to disclose. Our learning objectives today are three. We're going to describe the new epidemiologic data released by UNAIDS and then describe the new treatment and new prevention data presented at IAS 2019 in Mexico City. And there is a lot to talk about. So a couple pre-test questions. The first, a 44-year-old man recently diagnosed with HIV is concerned about drug side effects and wants to start an ART regimen with, quote, the lowest number of drugs available. 
which of the following initial two drug regimens has available two-year efficacy data? So is it cab, cabotegravir, rilpivirine, dolutegravir, and boosted darunavir, dolutegravir, lamivudine, or dolutegravir, rilpivirine? Okay, so uh, just over half of you voted for dolutegravir lamivudine, which is the correct answer, and we will review those data on this call today. Last pretest question. 26-year-old woman with HIV infection, not yet on ART, is considering becoming pregnant. She asks about the safety of HIV integrase inhibitors in pregnancy, which is true according to the latest data. Is it, one, raltegravir is a preferred drug in pregnancy, two, dolutegravir is contraindicated in pregnancy because of an increased risk of neural tube defects, three, L-vitegravir is considered an alternative drug in pregnancy, four, bictegravir is considered an alternative, or five, all of the above. Okay, polls closed, and just under half of you picked the correct answer. Number one, raltegravir is a preferred drug in pregnancy, and we will review those data today as well. Okay, so one of the annual events is an update of the UN AIDS epidemiologic data, and this typically comes out at the same time as the International AIDS Conference this year was no exception. So we now have up-to-the-minute data for HIV AIDS epidemiology. Where do we stand? According to the WHO 2019 annual report, these are the global HIV statistics as of the end of 2018. So currently there are about 38 million people globally who are living with HIV and 23 million people are now on antiretroviral therapy. Last year, 1.7 million people were newly infected with HIV, and 770,000 people died from AIDS-related illnesses. A total of about 75 million people have become infected with HIV since the start of the epidemic, and about 32 million of them have died from AIDS-related illnesses since the start of the epidemic, showing us that HIV is a true pandemic. People living with HIV, as mentioned, 38 million people living with HIV globally right now. The majority, over 36 million, are adults, although 1.7 million children are currently living with HIV. As of last year, 79% of all people globally living with HIV knew their HIV status, and that's obviously improved over recent years. However, doing the math, that leaves about 8 million people who are HIV infected who did not know that they had HIV infection. Here's a graph showing new HIV infections globally from the year 1990 all the way to 2018, the latest data available. You can see that the peak year for HIV infections was about 1997, where close to 3 million people were becoming newly infected each year. And since 1997, you can see that that has gradually decreased over time. Uh, bringing us to the current figure in 2018. You'll notice the green dot, which is the target that the UNAID set several years ago in terms of HIV infections, and unfortunately, it looks like the trend, if it continues the way it is, which it's likely to, will not achieve that goal of reducing HIV infections to that level. 
Here's the graph showing AIDS-related deaths. Again, you can see that the peak year for AIDS-related deaths of about 1.5 million deaths a year was roughly 2004, that this decreased sharply from 2004 to 2010 and has continued to decline to that time with the most currently available figure, about 770,000. The UNAIDS goal is in green dot here again, and it looks fairly close that AIDS-related deaths might actually achieve the goal there. Um, obviously, the decrease in deaths is related to the increase in antiretroviral infection and the use of prophylaxis across the world. In terms of the 90-90-90 goals, as already mentioned, last year, 79% of people globally living with HIV knew their status. Among them, 78% were accessing antiretroviral therapy, and among them, 86% were virally suppressed. So close to the 90-90-90 goals. Again, if you do the math in terms of absolutes, 79% know their status, 62% of the total group are on antiretroviral therapy, and just over half, 53% of all people globally were virally suppressed in 2018. A new statistic that people are looking at is shown on the bottom half of the slide. And that's the ratio of the incidence of new HIV infections to the prevalence, that is, per 100 people living with HIV. This ratio, if it's less than 3%, is associated with a decrease in cases over time. Um, when we talk about ending HIV, of course, at the same time we're talking about people taking antiretroviral therapy and prolonging their lives. But this new ratio actually talks about a decrease in HIV infections over time, decreasing the number of people living with HIV. And you can see 18 countries have actually uh, now fulfilled this criteria that they will see a decrease in the number of HIV infections or people living with HIV over time. And you can see the countries listed there. Uh, representing a variety of areas across the world, including countries from Africa, Asia, Europe, and other parts of the world. Okay, so with that background in terms of new epidemiology, let's turn to the International AIDS Society Conference in 2019. This was the smaller of the two annual conferences. This one is focused on HIV science. However, it was still quite a large meeting. As you can see, just under 6,000 attendees were at the meeting, representing nearly 130 countries across the globe. There were more than 90 sessions. There were 1,300 abstracts that were selected from a total of 3,000 submissions. Importantly, half of the abstract presenters were women, and more than a third were under the age of 35. So let's jump right in and focus on what was new in terms of treatment, antiretroviral therapy. What about initial therapy? So one of the most important studies that was presented was the advanced Study, and this was subsequently published in the New England Journal roughly about the same time. This study came from South Africa. It enrolled a population of people with HIV who were treatment naive, had viral load levels of at least 500 copies per mil, were not pregnant or had and did not have tuberculosis. And in this study, according to standard of care in South Africa, there was no baseline genotyping. A total of 1,053 people were enrolled and randomized to the study treatment, which was one of three options. One group was randomized to TAF, FTC, plus dolutegravir. A second group to, to TDF, FTC, with dolutegravir. And a third group to what was considered the standard of care, which was co-formulated TDF, FTC, and efavirenz. 
Shown in the graph on the left is the proportion of participants who suppress their viral level to less than 50 copies over time. So the TDF dolutegravir arm in blue, 85%, PAF FTC dolutegravir in red at 84%, and TDF FTC afavirenz in green at 79%. As expected, the two integrase containing regimens achieved an undetectable level or HIV RNA more rapidly, but as you can also see, the three groups tended to cluster towards the end of week 48. If you look in the table, you can see the statistical comparisons. So there was no difference between the TAF FTC dolutegravir and the TDF FTC dolutegravir. However, there was a statistical difference with TDF FTC dolutegravir outperforming the efavirenz-containing regimen and the p-value on that, 0.03. Interestingly, the TAF FTC dolutegravir regimen versus efavirenz, although there was a 5% difference, did not reach a p-value of statistical significance, although it was close at 0.08. And then it's worth knowing that grade 3, 4, so severe or life-threatening adverse events were numerically higher with the efavirenz group at 24% compared with either of the dolutegravir groups, which was 12 to 15%. One interesting substudy of this uh, clinical trial was a look at weight gain, and that's what's shown for you here, and this merited a separate presentation at the meeting. So the three regimens are identified in the same three colors, the TAF dolutegravir in red, TDF dolutegravir in blue, and the efavirenz regimen in green. And what's shown for you here is weight change in kilograms in men in the left graph and in women in the right graph. It's important to note that all groups experienced weight gain, um, but there are differences between the regimens. And you can see that in men, the regimens differ in weight gain that really occurs over the first 48 weeks and then plateaus in the second year. And higher weight gain was seen in either of the two dolutegravir arms with the highest weight gain of five kilograms in the TAF FTC dolutegravir group. Compared that to only one kilogram increase in the efavirenz group. And then it's striking to look at the right-hand graph, which is the same data but in women, and you can see the same trend that the two dolutegravir arms are associated with more weight gain than the efavirenz regimen, but also note that there is no plateauing. Weight gain continued over the 96 weeks of the study with a full 10 kilogram weight gain um, in women by 96 weeks on TAF FTC dolutegravir. So despite the virologic responses being similar, although statistically better in the dolutegravir arm, you can see that the weight gain is also more in the two dolutegravir arms, particularly in the TAF dolutegravir. What's the mechanism of this weight gain? It's really not known. Is this a class effect among integrase inhibitors? Again, prior data suggests that weight gain exists. There may be differences. Is there a difference between TAF and TDF? Some studies suggest that there's more weight gain with TAF, or is it weight loss with TDF? There are many unanswered questions. Another initial therapy study is the Gemini study. This is initial ART with a two-drug regimen of dolutegravir 3TC. We've seen the 48-week results from this study both presented and published and what was new at IAS was the 96-week results from the same study. This was a two, uh, para, two studies that were combined, Gemini 1 and 2, double-blinded, randomized, parallel group, and they were designed as non-inferiority two-drug versus standard three drugs. The study population were treatment naive, viral load levels up to 500,000 copies per mil, no chronic hepatitis B infection, and no resistance to either reverse transcriptase inhibitors or protease inhibitors. Combining the two studies gave a total sample size of over 1,400 people. 
They were randomized to receive either a standard three-drug regimen with TDF, FTC, dolutegravir, or the two-drug regimen of dolutegravir 3TC as initial therapy. Shown in the graph, the 48-week results, again previously presented, demonstrated non-inferiority of the two-drug regimen to the three-drug regimen, and 96 results shown for you here and first presented at this meeting, again, show no difference between the groups with dolutegravir 3TC being non-inferior in terms of suppression below 50 copies at the end of 96 weeks. And you can see the suppression rate is between 86 and 89 percent. Of people who experienced breakthrough on these regimens, interestingly, there was no drug resistance seen. This answers one of the pretest questions, which two-drug regimen has 96-week durable data, and the answer was dolutegravir 3TC. It'll be interesting to see what people do with these data and how guidelines panels will interpret these data in terms of preferred regimens for HIV. The REFLATE study was presented at IAS 2019. This is an initial antiretroviral therapy study in people who also are co-infected with tuberculosis. It was phase three randomized open-label non-inferiority with a 12% margin study that was done in a variety of countries Brazil, Côte d'Ivoire, France, Mozambique, and Vietnam. Study population were HIV infected, treatment naive, with tuberculosis who were on TB treatment. And they were randomized to the standard of care, TDF3TC with the Fabarins, or the study regimen here was TDF3TC and double dose raltegravir. The efficacy outcome is the proportion suppressed to less than 50 using intent to treat at week 48, and the red circle shows you the results. So in blue is the afavirenz group, and you can see 66% suppression rate, and compare that within pink is the raltegravir group. Uh, that showed a 61% suppression rate. Over on the right, then, the treatment difference is minus 5, and you can see that the confidence interval there actually crosses the 12% line, meaning that the concept of non-inferiority is rejected in this study. That is, raltegravir twice a day was not non-inferior to the standard of Favarin's regimen. And the interpretation there is that it should not routinely be used for initial therapy with TB meds. That was a bit of a surprise because similar results with dolutegravir did demonstrate non-inferiority. The PAMO study was a look at antiretroviral therapy and neural tube defects and focused in this updated presentation that was both presented at the IAS meeting and simultaneously published in the New England Journal the same day, took a look at dolutegravir. Um, the original association was made with more limited data, and this updated association data added many more pregnant women and their outcomes to the study. So the updated data were 18 sites from Botswana with more than 119,000 deliveries, and that actually accounts for 72% of all births in the country of Botswana. They updated the data in terms of risk of neural tube defects through March of 2019. And what you see in the graph, and this is from the New England Journal article, is that the overall risk of neural tube defect with the dolutegravir group, the first one listed there, is 0.3%. That was five neural tube defects um, in over 1,600 exposures. The far right is the reference data for HIV negative mothers, and you can see neural tube defects 0.08%. And then the three middle groups vary by the antiretroviral therapy. Uh, so I should have said dolutegravir given at the time of conception was associated with 0.3% risk. The next group is any non-dolutegravir ART at the time of conception, 
and you can see it's 0.1% there. The next group is of favorins at conception, 0.04%, and then the fourth group, dolutegravir started during pregnancy but not during conception, and you can see it's 0.03. The conclusion of the study was that the incidence of neural tube defects was, quote, slightly higher with dolutegravir, three in a thousand deliveries, than other antiretroviral drugs, one in a thousand deliveries, although the investigators emphasized that this is a low rate overall. There were other presentations on neural tube defects, one from Botswana, which accounted for the additional 19% of births, so almost all births in Botswana covered by these two studies together. This was a smaller study. They saw three neural tube defects um, in women who received dolutegravir during the time of conception. That gave a rate of 0.66% and that compared with the background rate of 0.09%. Interesting to know that in Botswana, folate supplementation is not routinely given. Contrast those results with the results presented from Brazil, where they did a retrospective cohort in two recent years, 2017 and 18, looked at ART exposure during pregnancy or within eight weeks of conception using uh, ultrasound. But in Brazil, 50% of the women took folate supplements. So in the overall population of 1486 pregnant women, there were 382 on dolutegravir, 125 on raltegravir, and over 1,000 on efavirenz. They saw no neural tube defects in any of the pregnant women there, although the investigator who presented recognized that they may have been underpowered. And then what about data in uh, the U.S. and developed, more developed countries? Uh, ART pregnancy registry exists. Lynn Moffinson presented the updated data for neural tube defects. They have seen one in 248. That gives a 0.4% incidence on dolutegravir versus 0.03% on all other antiretrovirals. And important to know about 75% of that data is, is from the U.S. and Canada. And as you know, folate supplementation is common. Is folate the crucial ingredient here? Is that the issue with dolutegravir? Uh, people don't know for sure. That's being looked into. So what do you do with these incidences, these low rates but numerically higher on dolutegravir? As you know, the WHO has rolled out dolutegravir across the world. They issued updated ART recommendations the same day that these data came out, and these are posted from the WHO website. And they say that, as you can see in the chart, dolutegravir for people living with HIV starting ART should be given to all adults and adolescents, including pregnant women and women of childbearing potential. And they make the point that the risk of neural tube defects, regardless of dolutegravir or other meds, is very low. It'll be interesting to see what other guidelines panels do with this, particularly in, in countries with more resources. OK, what about switch and maintenance studies? So study 380-40-30 was a phase three double-blinded randomized non-inferiority with a margin of 4% active controlled switch study. They enrolled people who were HIV infected taking either of the two tenofovir regimen or formulations with FTC and dolutegravir who were suppressed for at least three months if no prior drug resistance or at least six months if they had prior nuke resistance. They had adequate renal function and no prior virologic failure on an INST or integrase inhibitor and no integrase resistance. And they enrolled over 500 people suppressed on their dolutegravir regimens. They were randomized to change to TAF FTC dolutegravir or continue it if they were on it or switch to TAF FTC bictegravir. And again, I'll remind you, this was a double-blinded study, so everyone took three pills. Here's the results, and they're quite good. You can see that more than 90% of all people enrolled in the study 
maintained a viral load less than 50 by the end of 48 weeks, and that fulfilled the non-inferiority definition. There were also no differences in adverse events between the two groups. So the conclusion of this study was that TAF-FTC bictegravir was non-inferior to continuing a dolutegravir-based regimen. An interesting ART switch study in women was presented by Sissy Kitchio. This was a phase three randomized open-label active controlled study. It took people who were on tenofovir, either formulation, FTC and boosted L-vitegravir, or TDF-FTC adizanivir with suppression and adequate renal function from five countries, Dominican Republic, Russia, Thailand, Uganda, and the US. And they enrolled 470 women. They were randomized to either stay on their current regimen or change to TAF, FTC, and Bictegravir for 48 weeks. And then all of the participants were offered the switch to the Bictegravir regimen through 96 weeks. Shown for you in the chart there are the virologic outcomes at both week 48 and week 96 in the two groups. And you can see that women did exceptionally well with over 98% in all of the groups successful in suppressing their viral load level to less than 50 copies, either continuing on their regimen or switching to the Bictegravir regimen either right away or after 48 weeks. There was relatively little resistance. One person in the control group developed an M184V, and there was no resistance in the Bictegravir group. And the conclusion of the study was that all of these regimens led to high virologic suppression rates through the end of 96 weeks. The TANGO study was an interesting switch study to a two-drug regimen of dolutegravir 3TC. It was randomized open-label parallel group non-inferiority study. It enrolled people who were taking a TAF-based ART regimen with a viral load suppressed to less than 50 for at least six months, no chronic hepatitis B, and no virologic failure or prior resistance to nucleosides or integrase inhibitors. And they enrolled over 740 participants. They were randomized to either continue their three-drug regimen that was TAF-based, or switch to the two-drug regimen of dolutegravir 3TC. Shown for you in the graph are the outcomes, and you can see over 93% in both groups continued to have a viral load level suppressed to less than 50. Over on the right, you see the treatment difference, and it does fulfill the definition of non-inferiority. Um, of those few people, it was only three with viral loads above 50, no drug resistance was documented. So the investigators concluded that in people suppressed on three drugs for more than six months, a switch to two drug maintenance was non-inferior compared to continuing the three drugs. And again, it will be interesting to see what guidelines panels do with these data. Dualis was a study switching to a novel regimen of dolutegravir and boosted darunavir, so an integrase PI-based maintenance regimen. This was a German study, phase 3B, randomized open label, again, non-inferiority, with a margin of 10%. They enrolled people taking two nukes and boosted darunavir for at least 24 weeks with suppressed viral load and no evidence of chronic hep B infection. They were randomized to dolutegravir and boosted darunavir, that either boosted with ritonavir or cobacistat, or to continue their two-nuke and boosted darunavir regimen. And the graph shows you both groups did well. So either continuing or switching to the two-drug regimen of dolutegravir boosted darunavir succeeded in over 85% of people continuing to be suppressed below detection. The cabotegravir rilpivirine maintenance study looked at the pooled analysis of the ATLAS and FLARE studies. Now, these were two studies of an all-injectable maintenance regimen 
that were first presented at the CORI meeting. And what we saw here in a poster form was pooling the results together. Not surprisingly, given that each of these studies did well, you would expect that the pooled analysis would also show that this all-injectable two-drug regimen succeeded in suppressing people, and that would be true. So in the initial study in both ATLAS and FLAIR, they were randomized to either continue their regimen, shown in purple in the bar, or switch to the all-injectable regimen of cabotegravir and rilpivirine, LA is long-acting. And you can see in panel A that people did well. Over 93% were suppressed by the end of 48 weeks pooling the results. And in B, it shows that the treatment difference was small and did not exceed the non-inferiority margin, confirming the results of the individual studies. What perhaps was more interesting is when you pool the data, the sample size get bigger for individual groups. That's shown over on the right, figure four. And you can see a breakdown by gender, by race, by BMI, age, baseline CD4, and baseline ART. And note on the right, really no obvious differences in any of these subgroup analyses between continuing oral suppressive antivirals or switching to the all injectable regimen. In terms of safety, the only difference between these two arms in the pooled analysis, as one would expect, are injection site reactions. And you can see over in figure five to the right that although 70% of people reported these initially, that that decreases over time. And by the end of 48 weeks, it's less than 20% had injection site reactions. 99% of these were mild to moderate, and most resolved with, within a week. They then looked at, a, and this was an oral presentation, at what the acceptability of the all-injectable regimen was, and focused um, on one of the two studies, the ATLAS study. So shown on the left is acceptability of ISR, injection site reactions, and pain. And you can see at uh, week five, early on in the study, that uh, people, about half said it was totally acceptable, another quarter very acceptable in terms of injection site reactions, and on the right-hand graph, pain. But by week 48, these numbers had improved, and so roughly um, 85 to 90 percent said that it, it was either totally acceptable or very acceptable. And then they did a complicated analysis of treatment satisfaction, and ultimately 88% of the people who enrolled in the study ultimately preferred the injectable regimen at the end of the study at week 48, preferred it over daily oral therapy. Only 2% preferred oral therapy at that time. Now, those are interesting results, but you might think it's like this. This is a picture of Celine Dion. So if you go to a Celine Dion concert and you ask people, do you like Celine Dion, many people would say yes. Perhaps not everybody, but many. It's kind of the same thing as enrolling an all-injectable regimen where people are hoping to get that regimen and then asking them, do they like all-injectable regimens? And so those results are similar. Sorry, Celine. A highly controversial study was the French Quatuor study, also known as ANRS-170. Open-label randomized parallel non-inferiority with a margin of 5% phase 3 study. They enrolled people on ART with a viral load less than 50 for at least 12 months and no documented resistance mutations. And they enrolled over 600 people. They were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either take their ART every day or four of seven days a week. And that was a maintenance strategy. They were stratified by their third agent class. And as you can see, about half were on NNRTIs and half on integrase inhibitors. Only a small group were on protease inhibitors. The results show, as you can see in the panel on the bottom, that the four days a week group shown in orange was non-inferior to the seven days a week group shown in purple. It did fulfill their definition of non-inferiority. This was very controversial at the meeting. One of the 
the uh, concerns with the virologic failures, although these were uncommon in either group, you could see that in the four of seven day group, they were more often associated with drug resistance. The investigators concluded that taking ART four out of seven days a week was non-inferior with a 43% cost decrease. Um, however, there was a lot of skepticism in the room and uh, I would say that people were generally not convinced based on the data that we saw. However, 96-week and genital secretion results are pending for this study. One of the highlights of a conference, of course, are new agents, and this year's IAS was no exception to that. A newly named drug, or I should say compound, it's not yet a drug, is, is Latrivir, abbreviated ISL. This used to be called MK8591 or EFDA. It is an adenosine analog. It is a DNA chain terminator, and it's a reverse transcriptase inhibitor that inhibits that enzyme also by preventing translocation. So an NRTTI is a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. One of the features of this compound is that it has an exceedingly long half-life, 50 to 60 hours, which could mean very infrequent dosing. It accumulates in target tissues, and it is quite potent. Uh, you can see the uh, EC50 there on the nanomolar range. Um, it can be given low dose and also parenteral formulations. We saw at the IAS meeting two years ago that it was associated with decreases in viral load levels. Um, as you can see there, almost up to two log drops over 10 days. Well, that's the older news. The newer news was a study that looked at three doses of Islatravir in combination with Deraverine and 3TC. And note the three doses, how low the milligram dose is, 0 0.25, 0 0.75, and 2.25. This was a randomized study in treatment naive people. It was uh, phase two, so only about 30 patients per group. And they compared it with, in gray, the reference regimen, which was Deraverine, the NNRTI, with 3TC and TDF. This was the first part of the study. Part two, which I'll also show you, looked at a maintenance strategy. So let's focus on part one. So people did well over 24 weeks. You can see the three is Latrivir arms had comparable virologic suppression rates over 87% compared to the standard two nukes and deraverine regimen. And in terms of adverse events, they were similar between the three groups of Islatravir as well as the control group. So next was focused on simplifying after 24 weeks of suppression to a novel two-drug regimen of Islatravir with Deraverine given once daily and comparing that with the standard three-drug regimen. And here are the results. So the virologic suppression rates were high. As you can see, over 77% of all participants had a viral load less than 50 by the end of 48 weeks, including the three arms with the novel is Latravir Deraverine two drug regimen. In terms of safety, two participants, both on the higher dose of this Latravir, discontinued due to adverse events. And their conclusion was that the novel two drug regimen of his Latravir Deraverine has comparable suppression rates and was generally well tolerated in this phase two study. Another new drug on the scene is the HIV entry inhibitor. As you know, there are three types of these. We've had in the middle co-receptor um, binding inhibitors, including the CCR5 antagonist Maraviroc, and of course on the right, the fusion inhibitor in Fuvertide. But the newer drugs are CD4 binding inhibitors. You're aware of ibilizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody that binds to CD4 and is recently FDA approved. And the newer one is fostemzivir. This is an investigational agent. It's a small oral molecule which binds to GP120, preventing it from binding to the CD4 receptor. 
So fostemzivir is the name of this oral HIV attachment inhibitor. It's a prodrug. It's broken down to the active com compound, which is temzivir. And as mentioned, it blocks CD4 binding by GP120. PK suggests daily dosing. And the phase one study, which was published in 2012, shows that it is virologically active. And as you can see, that study medication was associated with over a 1.5 log decrease in viral load levels. Although interestingly, over on the left, as seen, about 12% of participants in this study had baseline envelope polymorphisms, which rendered the compound inactive. So the phase three study we've previously heard is called the BRIGHT study. And this enrolled a heavily treatment experience group who were not screened for susceptibility to fostemzivir. They enrolled 272 participants who were heavily treatment experienced with one to two remaining ART classes. And they received either, in addition to their regimen, fostemzivir at a dose of 600 milligrams twice a day or a placebo. Another cohort was enrolled of 99 participants who had no remaining ART classes um, to go to, and they were not randomized. They all received fostemzivir. The endpoint for this phase three study, according to new FDA guidelines, is day eight, very short, showing a viral load change just by adding the study compound fostemzivir. You can see the results there. In the placebo group, not unexpectedly, 0.2 log viral load change versus 0.8 log copies per mil with fostemzivir. That's highly statistically significant. However, we're not satisfied, of course, with eight days of treatment. And they weren't in the study either. They went on to optimize the background ART. And the 48-week results showed that viral load was suppressed to less than 40 copies per mil in over half of the people, 54% in the randomized group and 38% in the heavily treatment experience group with no other option, a non-randomized group. And we heard those results in Glasgow last fall. What was new at IAS 2019 were the two-year follow-on results. And you can see that the results were durable. So at week 96, 60% of the randomized group versus 37% of the non-randomized group, who all got fostemzivir, uh, were suppressed below 40 copies. So this is demonstrating that fostemzivir has significant and durable virologic activity, even in heavily treatment experienced people. The company announced that they plan a filing for approval this year in 2019. And this will offer hope to our patients who have high levels of treatment experience on multiple ART classes. A new class that's in development are the HIV capsid inhibitors. And this is a diagram showing how they work. So over on the left-hand side is HIV with its the green showing its central core encasing the two copies of RNA. It binds to the CD4. And then that green capsid structure has to disintegrate to or disassemble to expose the RNA RNA of the virus inside the cell, which again migrates to uh, or is transcribed to DNA, and viral DNA migrates to the cell and infects the cell. Later on, is used as a template to make new antiviral proteins, including capsid proteins. And this has to assemble for the new viral particles to become fully mature and infectious. The capsid inhibitors are a new class of compounds that targets both the disassembly and the assembly of the capsid. So two different steps in the viral life cycle. No previous HIV drugs have targeted the HIV capsid. So the new capsid inhibitor, doesn't have a name yet, is GS6207. It's potent in the test tube. And you can see we're on the picomolar um, of activity of this compound. It's active against all <laughs> and resistant variants have low fitness. It also is very long-lived. It has a long half-life of 30 to 43 days, meaning that it could be dosed exceedingly um, infrequently.
frequently, perhaps weekly or even less than that. Uh, we heard the results at the CROI meeting of a phase one single sub-Q dose in HIV negative volunteers, and they tested four different doses, and you can see the pharmacokinetics over on the right. A single dose led to detectable levels, particularly at the higher doses, up to 12 weeks later. Um, and then detectable levels persisted for even 24 weeks or six months later. So target levels were met, and these were long-lived, even with just a single dose of, these, of this compound. What was new at the IAS meeting were the first data with this compound in HIV infected. <laughs> and this was a poster. Um, and presented by Eric Dar from Los Angeles. They enrolled people with viral load levels between 5,000 and 400,000, and CD4s over 200, who had never taken an integrase inhibitor and were naive to capsid inhibitors. And they tested a short course of therapy with GS6207 at the three doses listed versus placebo over 10 days, and then transitioned over to a are an antiretroviral regimen and with TAF, FTC, and Bictegravir. So how'd they do? This shows you the antiviral activity over the 10 days of monotherapy. There's only six participants in each group, but you can see potent antiviral activity on the order of two logs at the highest dose tested compared with the placebo group in gray showing no difference. Another poster at the meeting did show that in vitro resistance could occur, and not surprisingly, this was due to the emergence of mutations in the capsid protein at position 67 and 74, and others were also characterized. However, no treatment emergent resistance was seen in the clinical study. Okay, switching gears for the end is ART prevention. On-demand PrEP continues to be a strategy not approved by the FDA, but widely used um, in Europe and elsewhere. The Prevenir study was presented at the IS 2019 meeting, and this was an interim report from this study. This is an open-label prospective cohort study that is being performed in the Paris metropolitan area. They aim to enroll HIV-negative, high-risk adults with inconsistent condom use, adequate renal function, and who were hepatitis B negative. Over 3,000 people had been enrolled. They're allowed to choose between taking PrEP with TDF-FTC on a daily basis or on the on-demand dosing basis, which, as you will recall, is 211. Take two TDF-FTCs within two to 24 hours before sex, and then one TDF-FTC 24 hours later, and one 48 hours later. Interestingly, they allowed the participants in this cohort study to switch back and forth between these two strategies if they required, and they were seen every three months. Their goal was ambitious, and that is to roll out PrEP and to show a 15% decrease in new HIV infections on a population level in Paris. What did they see? Well, as you can see from the, uh, the figure over on the right, the HIV incidence rates were zero in the TDF-FTC daily regimen, and they saw two seroconversions in the on-demand group. Um, however, when they went back and looked, both of those participants had been off PrEP for seven to ten weeks. There were three PrEP discontinuations due to GI side effects. So overall, they concluded with a mean follow-up of about nine months that there was high efficacy of both daily and on-demand PrEP, and that they had averted, based on historical data, 143 HIV infections. DISCOVER is a study that we had previously heard about testing for the first time a novel PrEP regimen of TAF-FTC and comparing it directly with TDF-FTC. These results had been previously presented showing non-inferiority of the TAF regimen with a total number of infections 22 with seven in the TAF group 
and 15 in the TDF group. What was new at this meeting were sub-analyses, and they really saw no differences between the two regimens. They emphasized some published PK data showing that TAF achieves the target effective concentration, the EC90, within four hours, where TDF takes three days. And the investigator who presented this, Chris Spinner from Munich, emphasized that TAF could be, quote, potentially more efficacious based on that data. That was very controversial and engendered a lot of comments and questions from the audience. You may know that the FDA Advisory Committee uh, recently took a vote formally on TAF-FTC for approval for PrEP based on the DISCOVER study, and the committee voted 60, 16 to 2 in favor of approval of TAF-FTC for men, but 10 to 8 against approval for women, and you might ask why. But recall that the DISCOVER study did not enroll women. There were no women enrolled in the 5,300 participants. So the FDA has not yet said what it's going to do with this recommendation. Is Latrovir, which is the compound I talked about before, uh, potent at very low dose, also lends itself to putting in an implant? This would be a completely new way of giving an antiretroviral. Of course, implants are not new for contraception, and shown for you in the figure, is the available uh, implant for contraception for women. And uh, you can see that it's small. It's actually inserted in the upper arm. They simply put Islatrovir in this same polymer in the form of an implant. And shown in the graph for you there shows that it actually achieved target levels. Well, they went on to test this in a clinical study and they tested it in two doses, 54 and 62 milligrams, and had a third group that had placebo um, with the implants. And this was a pharmacokinetic study to look at drug levels over time. What they showed was that this implant was associated with detectable drug levels in human participants for 12 weeks at both the 54 and 62 milligram doses. And uh, the 62 milligram was actually associated with achieving target levels over those 12 weeks. They went on to use these data and concluded that Islatrovir levels would be detectable for actually a year or even longer. So if this compound could be used for PrEP or combined with other agents for ART, it might lead to the first implantable antiretroviral regimen. That would obviously be a major step forward and offer choice. Lastly, an HIV vaccine study called ASCENT was presented. This was an HBTN study co-sponsored, uh, phase two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study done in two African countries, Kenya and Rwanda, and the US. They enrolled 152 healthy adults, so this is phase two. Uh, with uh, distribution both in men and women. And they were vaccinated with, as you can see there, a previously tested Clade C Mosaic GP140 um, tested vaccine versus a placebo. Uh, the Clade C part had been tested before, and they were adding the Mosaic GP140. And this was boosted with an adenovirus. Uh, the results at 52 weeks, four weeks after the last vaccination, showed that both active vaccine regimens induced binding and antibodies, and that the clade C responses were not reduced with adding the mosaic GP140, which picks up clade B, which of course is the strain most common in the US, Europe, Australia. Uh, and that these were well tolerated with no serious side effects. And this was the modeling um, of the proportion with a response. And you can see both in green bivalent, meaning both B and C, the responses looked similar to the clade C results. And so they announced that they were going to roll this out as a phase three efficacy study called Mosaico. Uh, this will be co-sponsored by the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, 
um, called 706, and they're going to evaluate this on a much greater scale, targeting 3,800 HIV-negative individuals in North America, South America, in Europe, and it's expected to start later this year. So that's the end of my formal presentation, right at the 2 o'clock hour. And uh, please, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat everyone box. And uh, let's do some post-test questions. This will test to see if you heard me say what the right answer is already. 44-year-old man recently diagnosed with HIV uh, wants the lowest number of drugs possible. Which initial two-drug therapy has two-year efficacy data? If you get this wrong, it meant that you uh, were late or perhaps weren't listening. <laughs> OK, I think we can stop. So 88% of you, or 87%, picked the correct regimen. Dolutegravir lamivudine is the initial two-drug therapy with 96-week data. All the other two-drug regimens there do have some data, but it's all maintenance therapy, meaning in people who are already suppressed. Let's do the next post-test question. Again, were you listening? 26-year-old woman, HIV infection, becoming pregnant, and wants to know about integrase inhibitors. Which of the statements is true? RAL, Tegravir is preferred. Dolutegravir is contraindicated because of neural tube defects. Elvitegravir is an alternative, or Bictegravir is an alternative, or all of the above. OK, and I think we can stop this, too. So the data showed that Dolutegravir is associated with a very small chance of neural tube defects if it's administrated, administered at the time of conception, but not later in pregnancy. So actually, current US perinatal guidelines say that dolutegravir may be used after the first trimester or continued. If you look at the perinatal guidelines, raltegravir is a preferred drug currently. Elvitegravir is contraindicated because of the cobacystat, so that's an incorrect choice. Bictegravir simply doesn't have enough data, and so that's what it says in the guidelines. So it is not considered an alternative. OK. So questions. Let's see. I'm looking now at the chat everyone box, starting from the bottom. What will guidelines do with the updated dolutegravir data and neural tube defects? That's a great question. Guidelines panels are actively discussing this. As reviewed earlier in the talk, WHO came out and said, these incidence rates of neural tube defects are low, and we think dolutegravir is still recommended for everyone. That really applies to low- and middle-income countries and comes from the public health approach. I think in developed countries and resource-rich countries, we don't know yet how the guideline panels are going to ring in on this. So I think it'll be interesting. Um, let's see. The comment on two drug regimens in people with HIV and chronic hepatitis B. That's an excellent question. You'll note that the two drug regimen, dolutegravir 3TC, only contains one active drug for hepatitis B. And we know that if you give one drug for hepatitis B with lamivudine, you will develop lamivudine resistance. So these patients were excluded with chronic hep B. And I think we could say we would not use that two-drug regimen in people with chronic hep B and HIV. You would want two drugs for hepatitis B, meaning you need tenofovir, either formulation. OK. Let's see what else I got here. Uh, a question about the Islatravir study. Do you believe the poor outcomes from the high dose, 2.25, was due to tolerability and associated poor adherence? I'm not sure I would characterize the results as poor. There were two patients who did have adverse events, whether that was drug-related or not, not crystal clear. 
Um, but I think probably they're going to go with the lower dose moving forward. Let's see. WHO recommends TDF-FTC as initial treatment in pregnant women. There were more, there were less premature birth and less neonatal mortality with AZT3TC. Um, I guess I'm not as familiar with those data. However, I would say that AZT is really associated with unacceptable toxicity, particularly GI, and uh, very hard in pregnancy to have a medication with GI side effects. So I'm not as enthusiastic there. There is a good um, experience with tenofovir in pregnancy. The U.S. perinatal guidelines recommend TDF. Um, there are not enough data on TAF to recommend that routinely in pregnancy. All right. Have there been studies of dolutegravir in pregnancy that looked at weight gain and its in impact on weight-related pregnancy complications? And I would say I'm not aware that there are any studies in that particular scenario. Just to generalize about integrase inhibitors and weight gain, I think this is an active area of investigation right now. People really are trying to figure out, is this association real? What might the mechanism be? And what's the most appropriate response to it? Should we be changing regimens? And if so, what regimen to change to? Or is this really not related to the antiretroviral therapy? Uh, these questions loom large. I really don't think we have the answers to everything. All right. Lots of comments about the audio. Hopefully that works. Let's see what else I have. Okay. Despite the guideline to treat all patients with HIV, some providers consider no necessity for treatment for those non-progressors, meaning low viral load and CD4 count normal. What's your opinion? So of, you're right to say that all current guidelines say in general terms, treat everyone with HIV. And this would include long-term non-progressors, even people who have viral load levels that are not detectable for years and maintain CD4 cell counts. I think if you look at the non-progressor group, it's actually a heterogeneous group. Some of that group actually have low-level viremia, and some of them will have CD4 counts that do decrease over time. We don't have clinical trials data to show that treating non-progressors is associated with benefits, but there are some suggestions that the anti-inflammation properties that you get from antiretrovirals might be of benefit. And so I think many experts in the field are recommending treat, treating, or I should say offering treatment, even to long-term non-progressors on the theoretical basis that that decreases inflammation related to even low-level viremia over time. Okay, what else here? Must we change dolutegravir-based regimen during elevation of ALT and AST due to hepatotoxicity of dolutegravir? Dolutegravir not associated with hepatotoxicity. So uh, I would look for another cause of hepatotoxicity if you're seeing that on an integrase inhibitor. That would be exceedingly uncommon. Let's see. I'm, I'm not understanding this question. Urgent therapy is your choice for patients like the RAPID study. And I think they're trying to clarify what they mean here. Okay, I think maybe what you're asking is, if you choose to start therapy the same day, same day ART, which regimen would you choose? And I think what's being chosen most commonly is one of the newer integrase 
inhibitors, either a dolutegravir-based regimen or a RALT, uh, sorry, BIC-tegravir-based regimen. And why do I say that? The incidence of integrase resistance in the community right now remains very low. In fact, current guidelines do not suggest checking an integrase genotype before starting therapy unless a special circumstance, for instance, a partner who is on an integrase inhibitor with viremia or who was known to have integrase resistance. So those regimens would lend themselves to rapid start, both because of their potency, their barrier to resistance, um, their tolerability, and their convenience. An alternative would be to start an integrase inhibitor, like a darunavir-based regimen, rapid start, um, again, with uh, resistance considerations in mind. So I think those are the most common regimens that are being used out there. Hopefully that answered your question. Okay, we're almost at the end here. And uh, I tried to get to mostly everybody's questions, so I hope I got to your uh, this webinar will be available um, on demand viewing. CMV credit is not um, available for watching it later if you attended today. That makes sense. The evaluations, as mentioned earlier, will be available today on your IAS USA My Activities page by the end of the day, and you can receive the CMV credits. So check the IAS USA website for that. Final question. You better get this one right, because I just said it a minute ago. <laughs> OK, let's stop. All right, so you know when it's going to be ready. And the four people who didn't know, well, now you know, too. <laughs>